So it's seven o'clock. I'll get started and folks can sort of hop in. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at SPP's very first online community panel. Uh, my name is Taryn and I've been part of the organizing committee for this event along with a group of SVP partners, including our moderator, uh, Amanda Stevens. Um, and of course, our three panelists who have contributed lots of good information. Before we begin, thank you everyone for the work that you've put into making this a possibility. Uh, it's my pleasure to give everyone a quick introduction tonight, but they'll also share a little bit more about themselves as we get started. Uh, if you have questions, um, feel free to click on the Q&A button down at the bottom, uh, right in the middle. Uh, and type in your question. I'll make sure that those questions make it to our panelists. Uh, we will reserve about 20 minutes at the end for informal Q&A uh, and we'll have structured questions throughout the course of the webinar. Uh, so yes, please bring us your questions. Uh, no such thing as a dumb question, so please ask. Uh, our first panelist tonight is uh, Grace Birmingham. She has 18 plus years of experience working with the region of Waterloo's public health uh, and is currently their manager of harm reduction. Uh, she also co-chairs the harm reduction uh, pillar of the Waterloo Region Integrated Drug Strategy. Welcome Grace, thank you for being here. Uh, Rob, uh, with the awesome paramedic setup behind him, is our, uh, he's Rob Crossan is our current Deputy Chief with Waterloo Region Paramedic Services. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in the field and works closely with public health and Waterloo Region Integrated Drug Strategy towards harm reduction. Rob, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and last but definitely not least is uh, Violet Umanitz, and she joins us from Sanguine Health Center. She's worked with Sanguine since 2011 uh, and currently manages the day-to-day -day operations of uh, Kitchener's, oh, how's it worded? Thanks, sorry, consumption and treatment services. Uh, she uh, believes that everyone uh, is the expert in themselves and strives to be non-judgmental, honest and open and to learn from all the people around her. So please welcome all, all three of our panelists. And last but definitely not least is our moderator, Amanda Stevens, who is a proud new member of Social Venture Partners Waterloo Region. She is a registered physiotherapist currently working in Waterloo and initially developed an interest in this area when she was treating patients who had persistent pain. Uh, she's a Waterloo uh, resident and lives just outside it with her young family. So please welcome everyone. Amanda, at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks, Taryn. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna start with a little bit of an intro from everyone, um, kind of giving us your background in the area that you're working in in this uh, field. So Grace, why don't we start with you? Great, thanks Taryn and Amanda. Just really, um, really appreciative of being uh, invited to this and um, so happy that you were able to organize it even during this really odd time of COVID-19. So thank you so much. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I do manage the harm reduction program for Region of Waterloo Public Health. What that program does is really ensure the availability of harm reduction programs and services and as mandated under the Ontario Public Health Standards and specifically under the Substance Use Prevention and Harm Reduction Guidelines, so that's a mouthful. Um, and really all that means is that uh, we support community planning, we provide services uh, with respect to harm reduction so that people who use substances have access to different harm reduction supplies and services that they might need. So when we talk about uh, harm reduction services, um, we, we talk often about needle syringe programs or needle exchange programs where people can get access to sterile drug use equipment. Um, we talk about sharps disposal. So that means uh, making sure that people have access to sharps disposal containers and they have a place where they can bring those back when, they're, when they uh, have used them that we provide access to naloxone distribution. Naloxone is, the, um, is an antidote to an opioid overdose. And so we have a, a program where we uh, worked with partners to get that medication into people's hands. And we also work on leading opioid response strategies for the community. Part of this work, um, the opioid response piece, uh, was around exploring the need for supervised consumption services. We call them consumption and treatment services in Ontario. Uh, Taryn, that's why sometimes it's a mouthful. <laughs> it's called different things in different places. Um, but locally in Ontario, we call it consumption and treatment services. And uh, we worked on uh, leading some of the work around implementing those services in our region, along with a, a, a vast number of partners. 
locally, and I'll, I'll talk about this a lot likely um, this evening, is that our health unit in, in, in Waterloo Region doesn't do this work alone. Uh, we partner with many, many organizations and provide comprehensive harm reduction programming across the region. And we really would not be able to do this without those partnerships in place. In particular, our opioid response plan is co-led by the Waterloo Region Integrated Drug Strategy and whose work is organized by four different pillars. Harm reduction is one of those pillars and the other three is prevention, justice and enforcement and recovery and rehabilitation. And it's when we see all of these pillars working together that we believe we can make a, an impact on problematic substance use in our community. So I'll stop there and I'll let the others uh, introduce themselves. Awesome. Violet, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so as Taryn said initially, I've been with Sanguine Health Centre since 2011. Um, Sanguine is a not-for-profit organization that was originally founded to work with hepatitis C, so prevention and treatment of hepatitis C. And over the years, we've spent a lot of time developing harm reduction focused programming specifically for people who use drugs in our community in order to prevent hepatitis C, but also to keep people who use drugs safe, but also the greater community. So everybody is impacted in our communities by substance use, whether they are aware of it or not. And we try to keep people as safe as possible. And that's really the core of harm reduction. As Grace mentioned, there's a lot of focus on things like our needle syringe programming, or even on the consumption and treatment services that we offer. But harm reduction is a philosophy that can be applied to pretty much everybody, everywhere where no matter what you're doing with your life or how you're spending your time, you know, life is dangerous and harm reduction as it's as a philosophy is just about looking at ways to keep ourselves safe and our community safe and to, you know, take care of each other. And that's probably all I need to say right now, I think. Um, there'll probably be other other parts for me to chime in. Go for it, Rob. All right, well, um... I'm a deputy chief for the Regional Waterloo Paramedic Services. So as you can imagine, um, we attend a lot of overdose calls every year. Um, I was brought into, um, we're, we're a division of public health. So um, Grace and I ultimately have the same boss. Um, and uh, we were brought in um, about 20, early in 2016 with some phone calls uh, to myself saying, have you seen more overdoses uh, on opioids? than normal. And so we started looking into our, our, uh, our calls. We're like, yeah, we, we really have. So in, in uh, 2016, we attended 419, so almost a little over one call a day um, for opioid overdoses. And we, we were pretty alarmed at that. That was a lot. We thought, oh, one call a day, that's a problem. We need to bring that down. Um, for Right now, 2020 is almost the same volume as 2019. And in 2019, we did 1,115 overdose calls. So, um, you know, obviously the, the, the uh, opioid use epidemic has really exploded uh, since 2016. And um, without, without the work of, of our harm reduction folks, uh, Violet and Grace and all their great teams, I think we'd be in a lot worse situation. So, um, you know, we're happy to be part of it. Our, one of our main contributions other than caring for the patients of, of overdose is, is really giving the context of how many of these happen without some sort of data. You, you kind of think, well, there is an increase. Um, there seems to be more, but we can, we can say, look, you know, even since, since 2016, it's almost triple. So uh, it gives a context of where we're at. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, and I, I think we'll really see throughout this panel, like how much these groups are all working together. Um, and I should really thank Grace for bringing the panel together. We chatted in February when we were first talking about this. And she was like, well, you need this and this. And, and it was like, okay, perfect. And and then I think everyone was happy to help because Grace was involved. So um, thank you very much for <laughs> doing all that hard work. Um, we're gonna start our first question um, is kind of how this starts. So like, how can opioid addiction start? Maybe Violet, do you wanna touch on that one first? Sure, I think there's a number of ways, um, or I should say I know there's a number of ways 
And when I work with clients out in the community, so people who are actively using opiates, um, some will say that it started as a result of an injury and they were prescribed a medication that worked really well for that pain that they were experiencing. Um, something that most people I think are not aware of is that opioids do a phenomenal job of killing physical pain. I mean, people know that part, but what's not usually really um, known by most people is that it also does a great job of killing emotional pain. So it creates a really good feeling for a lot of people. Um, in some cases, a sense of euphoria, a sense of peacefulness, of calmness, of just a really good feeling. So people who have been struggling with a lot of things in life, um, you know, a lot of the social determinants of health, perhaps, and who then have an injury and are prescribed some of the medications, sometimes that's how that starts. The pain is, is fixed, but the emotional pain is also fixed, and that becomes a really powerful thing for people. Um, other people, it's through experimentation, so, you know, trying different substances recreationally or just, you know, just to see what happens when you take them, that we see a lot with youth in particular. Um, and again, when that, um, the opioids are hitting the receptors in the brain and creating that really good feeling of calmness and peacefulness, that's a feeling that I think most of us would like to experience more often than not. And if your life is already very difficult or challenging or you're going through a lot of things, that's that's something that's going to really um, feel good for you. Awesome. Thanks, Violet. And Grace or Rob, just jump in if you want to add to that. Well, I always, I like to, um, with opioids, you know, what, what they affect in your brain is, is um, they cause a release of dopamine. Um, and uh, I always like to to say dopamine is that that feeling you get when you come into your into your house and your dog comes running for you and you feel happy and wanted and know that you're in your safe place. Um, hopefully, you get some dopamine release when you see your significant other. Not necessarily, but hopefully, you still do. Um, it's that kind of thing, right? It's that it 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 it's that warm hug and and, and uh, excitement and happiness. And so, really. Uh, when when you see your dog running across the room to you, your brain releases dopamine. When you take an opioid, uh, especially initially, the first couple times, your brain releases a lot of dopamine, and you the, you uh, that feeling of of uh, being included and wanted and happy is is overwhelming. When we were doing some work around um, the feasibility and exploring the need of supervised consumption services in our region. Uh, one of the questions that we asked folks who are um, who have who are using substances was, you know, what was your first experience with drug use, and and what is your your drug of choice, and can you tell us a few reasons why um, why you are why you're using substances, and 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 overwhelmingly one of the themes that came out was an experience of trauma, um, an experience of uh, dealing with challenges that um, none of us really want to deal with. Violet talked about the social determinants of health, things like poverty, um, things like you know loss of employment, um, injury uh, leading to you know loss of employment, homelessness, all of those types of things. Um, but that theme of trauma and that that theme of high high stress uh, really seemed to run throughout all of those stories. Um, and so I think you know I think when we talk about susceptibility and vulnerability to addiction. Um, that feeling of euphoria that Rob and Violet spoke about becomes uh, a really key piece uh, and a way to escape the pains that none of us really want to feel. Awesome, thank you everyone. Um, kind of leading with, or next, like we kind of know who, like how this can start. Who is it generally imp impacted by? Have you guys noticed a change with like COVID-19 and who's being impacted at all? Grace, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think, um, and, and I'll speak a little bit to the data, and I know that Violet and Rob will likely speak to um, what they are seeing at the CTS and also on those 911 calls. Um, really, when we talk about um, opioids and the opioid crisis, um, it's effect, it affects everybody, frankly. Um, it, it, it doesn't discriminate um, across income levels. It doesn't discriminate across genders. Um, it really, everybody is vulnerable uh, to an opioid overdose. 
it's, uh, and we'll likely talk about this a bit more, the, it's the unpredictability of the drug supply in the community that um, often leads to an overdose because you may not be prepared for the strength of the drug that you're using, um, or you may not be prepared for an opioid um, response at all if, it's, if that's not the drug that you thought you were taking. And so uh, it's that unpredictability that uh, leads to people um, overdosing and uh, particularly uh, being more vulnerable to fatal overdoses. Um, and so for that reason, you do see it across all of those different socioeconomic lines. Um, does it impact some people more than others? Um, probably, uh, especially for those folks who, as we spoke about in the last question, experience those trauma and more like, are more likely to use opioids regularly. So I'll stop there and I'll let Rob and Violet chime in. Violet, did you? Yeah, I will. Ahead. I'll pop in. I was sort of looking at Rob wondering if he was going to pop in first. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, so, I mean, the reality is a lot of times when people are asking me questions about drug use or about people in our community who use drugs, it becomes really clear that we have this stereotyped picture in our heads of what someone with an addiction looks like and what they're experiencing. And certainly in some cases that's true, the stereotype fits in some cases, but over the years, you know, I haven't really seen a big change in who's impacted. As Grace said, it's everyone across the board. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how great your education is or isn't, what your family looks like. Um, you're susceptible depending on so many different factors. And again, as Grace said, you know, some, um, some people's experiences and some people's lives are going to be, make it much more difficult for them to maintain an addiction while also maintaining employment and housing and relationships. Um, depending on what else is going on for someone, it may become more visible or more problematic faster or slower. Um, depending on your support levels, depending on so many factors, you know, it's not necessarily um, easy to predict who will develop an addiction to any type of drug. And it's not easy to identify in the community who's struggling with an addiction. And as we work at the CTS, um, or as we work in harm reduction in general, you know, the people who are very, very visible are the people that we work with the most often. But the people who are hiding, the people who are using in their homes, um, which I'm sure Rob can speak to much better than I can, um, are equally, if not more, susceptible to things like overdose as a result of needing to hide as of the stigma, the shame, the, you know, the stereotypes that are out there. So I would say, you know, we haven't necessarily seen a shift in, in who's impacted by this. It's, it's everyone. It's across the board. Yeah, you know, when we, again, when we first started to, to see that wave of the opioid um, crisis, um, we, we dug a little deeper into, into the, the data we have. And that, again, that's one of the benefits of being part of, of um, public health is that we have epidemiologists and people who study that kind of data. And, um, you know, I knew from my experience as a medic in the field before I, before I became an administration, we would go to million dollar homes and they would be like, well, I don't know. He's, we found him in the bathroom. We think he had a stroke and uh, you know, uh, a well-to-do mid forties uh, individual on the ground. We start assessing for a stroke and we're like, oh, no, this is an opioid overdose. And we give a little naloxone and they come around. Um, and uh, so it's that, you know, uh, it's not that the people at that, at that million dollar house were, were making up what happened. They found this person and thinks maybe they had a stroke, but uh, because they're using in, they're, they're going into the bathroom or they're, they're going into a private area and, and using um, that drug um, and not telling anybody. And, and so um, it's that stigma and the stigma is what kills because if somebody doesn't come up to use the bathroom and find them on the ground there, when they come up three hours later, um, often it's too late. So when we look at the deaths uh, related to opioids, um, almost exclusively people that die from opioid use when 911 is called and when we get there, they are, uh, have been long dead because they've been using in, in, in uh, you know, cloistering themselves away and using without anybody else knowing. And uh, by the time they're found, it's too late. 
Wow, thanks everyone. Um, one of our questions kind of follow up with that is if there's, and I think you guys have already answered it and they maybe just look a little bit different, but if there's certain problem areas um, in our region that we see more um, cases, but it kind of sounds like not, is that is that right? They maybe just, yeah, not what we're expecting. There, if you look at a map, uh, we have developed heat maps of, of where these, these incidents occur. You're not going to be surprised where it is. It's in the middle of Kitchener and it's in Cambridge and it's in a little bit in the Waterloo. But if we did a heat map for where heart attack calls happen, where motor vehicle collision calls happen, it's going to look very similar, right? The calls are where the people are. So, um, yeah, it, it varies across the region. More interesting to me than the, the heat map of where the calls are is uh, a heat map that was um, developed by Water Regional Police of where the, of the fatal uh, opioid overdoses were. And they were primarily in, in the sub, subdivisions of, of the city, not in the, not in the core. Um, Robert, do you have any knowledge on, like, someone had asked about um, Guelph, like it seems like a bit of a hotbed right now. Is Do you have that data at all? Like is that, or does it, I don't know, those numbers are different or? I, I don't know, I've attended, I think, Violet, have you uh, attended some of the, with their drug strategy group over there? I have a little bit, but not enough to see. Yeah, I can't really speak to why that is. It could, it's, I think, um, and Grace would definitely know about that. It's really hard to know exactly the level of your problem. Like I say, we can report 1,200 opioid overdoses in a year that we've gone to as paramedics, but is that half of the ones that actually occur? Is it 40%? Is it 60%? We Honestly, we don't know. So it's really hard. I can't speak to Guelphs, but it, it's hard to really nail it down, right? Yeah, and I just add into that, I, I, I can't speak to Guelph um, in particular, but what we are hearing is that across the province, um, opioid overdoses are up everywhere. Uh, we have just in this year, for this year, um, we unfortunately just uh, surpassed the number of fatal overdoses um, this year compared to all of last year. So we know that overdoses are up here. We've heard that overdoses are up across other communities in Ontario. Um, we predict or we suspect that the, the pandemic has made an impact on the quality of drugs in our community and led to a higher toxicity of, of the drug supply. Um, but uh, yeah, specifically to, uh, to Guelph's situation, I, I, I don't have, um, I haven't seen their numbers. Um, thanks. And I think we could kind of keep diving in or diverting in, but we brought up the pandemic. so. <laughs> Let's maybe kind of go into how that maybe has changed things, um, both for maybe the people that we're seeing or how your organizations have had to kind of pivot and change. I can um, say from Sanguine, I mean, everything has changed. The core of the work that we're doing is still the same. People are still using drugs. People still need access to harm reduction, to healthcare you know, to all the things that all of us still need access to, but the challenges in delivering those services, particularly to people who may be um, experiencing other more complex issues has been a huge challenge across the board. So Sanguine operates our community health vans, and normally those are a really great community connection to people, both in terms of harm reduction, but also, you know, food, clothing, hygiene products, social contact, meeting with social workers and things like that. With a pandemic in place, we can't congregate. We can't have people coming together um, and waiting and, you know, standing around chatting with us and, and checking in. So that was the first thing that really took a hit for us was not being able to be out in the community, meeting people where they are. Um, the CTS has had to adjust significantly, both because we've been operating out of the interim site, which is a smaller space and has required us to decrease the number of people that can be within the space in order to adhere to physical distancing requirements. Um, 
And then on top of that, our community as a whole has shifted. So people who were previously accessing services in the um, sort of downtown area of Kitchener or who, you know, were coming to different agencies, when those agencies closed or shifted the way that they were doing their services or providing their services, people were not in the area the same as they were before. They weren't stopping in in the same way in the same time frames. And then we also very happily were able to relocate people out of some of the shelters and into um, some of the larger areas for people to be in, which is a fantastic thing for people to have that space and to have that, again, physical distancing. But it created challenges because when you tell people to shelter in place, they are sheltering in place. So they are, you know, using their drugs in their room. They're using drugs in their campsite. They're not coming to places because they've been told not to. Uh, so that became another really big challenge for us was wanting to keep our service levels as high as we possibly could so people could get what they needed, but also taking care of our staff, um, making sure that people had the right protective equipment, making sure that clients were safe when they came through the doors. Um, so for us, a lot of what happened at the CTS initially was us sending naloxone out into the community, um, putting them in the hands of people who would be able to respond to an overdose in a hotel room or in a campsite or in the places that people were. And then also just constantly asking people, please come back, please try to use, you know, your first dose of a drug at the site. Please come and check in with us. Please at least call us. It's been really hard not being able to find people or to know how people are doing or if they're even alive at this point in some cases. Um, it's really, really created a lot, a lot of issues that we did not anticipate I mean, we didn't think we'd have to contend with a pandemic when we opened a CTS either. So can't say that the planning part went uh, particularly smoothly on that initially, but we had to, I mean, just change very quickly and adapt very quickly. And I think the team did a phenomenal job of that, but you know, it's still a huge ongoing challenge even now. I mean, obviously for us, um, I'll, I'll just echo what, what Violet said. It's changed everything um, with how we respond to, to every call. Um, you know, if you call 911, the Ministry of Health dispatcher is going to get the ambulance going and they're going to ask you all those COVID questions that we have all become way too familiar with. You have a cough, you have a fever, da da da. Um, I will say, as close to 100% of people as possible can't generally can't answer those questions while somebody is overdosing in front of them, or they may not even know who that person is that's overdosing, perhaps they're a passerby, perhaps they found the person. So um, that, that comes in as an inconclusive, which means our paramedics, once we arrive at the scene, are putting on a whole bunch of PPE to go in. It's really hard to communicate to people. It's uh, uh, kind of scary for, for people to see big full face masks on and big filters and whatnot. Um, and, you know, you know, so that's just, it's slowing us down in getting to people. Um, it's, uh, it, it looks a little scary, but also um, where we're getting the people is, is shifting, right? I mean, you can't, um, people who, who don't, who use drugs, who don't have a place to go to safely use, um, unfortunately, we'll, we'll choose places that maybe are somewhat public where if there is an overdose, they can be found. And those places have pretty much dried up, right? You can't go in, you, I mean, you can now, but you couldn't go into a Tim Hortons or you couldn't go into a McDonald's or whatever. You couldn't go anywhere. So then, um, like Violet said, it's you're into your campsite or uh, a motel room or someplace a little more private. And I think um, that's why uh, Grace touched on the deaths are, are, are way up and, and I firmly believe that the COVID uh, has forced all those changes and, and just people are, are using it private more and, and that's a recipe for disaster. Grace, anything to add to that one? No. <laughs> oh, they've, they've covered it. <laughs> yeah. um, Violet, you mentioned um, wanting to pe like people to use that first time at a consumption site. Um, can you talk a little bit about like potency of drugs? Why, how are they dangerous? Fentanyl, can you start with that? <laughs> Go back a bit. Uh, right now, to be really blunt, everything is a disaster when it comes to drugs. 
<laughs> that's that's the best way for me to describe that. Um, when the borders close, when transportation is limited, when movement between communities or provinces is limited, the drug supply becomes really, really unpredictable and potentially really dangerous and potentially really toxic. And part of that is just depending on where the substances originate and part of it is where the chemicals perhaps to uh, manufacture those those substances are available there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces when it comes to the illicit just illicit substances in general um, we don't currently have safe supply programs in our community that are able to provide pharmaceutical predictable um, substances to people so people are relying very much on a black market where you know the the drug dealers whether they're the lower level or upper upper levels need to make money and the lower level drug dealers need to make money in order to support their own substance use so what we've seen you know since about one month after the pandemic hit is the overdoses became really unpredictable the drugs that people were using were not having the effects that they should have had based on what people thought that they were buying. Um, we've seen a lot of what we, we don't have the ability currently to test substances very well. So we have fentanyl test strips that will allow someone to identify if there's fentanyl in the, the substance that they've purchased, but it doesn't tell us the quality of it, the quantity of it, the potency of it, or what it's potentially contaminated with or cut with. Um, there are machines out there, they're phenomenally expensive, but it's my dream to have one of those in our community so that we have an idea of what we're seeing out there. So to give an example, we have people in our community who would purchase fentanyl um, intentionally because their tolerance to opioids is so significant after 5, 10, 15, 20 years of using opioids that fentanyl is not a dangerous substance specifically for them to be using. Um, but what's out there right now is not fentanyl, or it may be, you know, a small portion of it is. So people are, you know, purchasing substances and they're using them and they're not having the effect that they should. They're losing days. They are losing consciousness rapidly. They're being robbed. There's just a lot of awful things happening as a result of that. Not just with opioids, but with all the substances that are, are out there right now. Um, some of the substances, the prices have gone up significantly, which is always a challenge at the best of times for people to be able to afford the substances that they need. But right now, like, you know, when the, the price gouging went on around hand sanitizer, where you could, you know, expect to spend $100 for a little tiny pump of hand sanitizer that someone wanted to sell you on Kijiji, drugs are the same. Maybe not on the Kijiji part, but I mean, ultimately, also maybe on the Kijiji. I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure on that part. But the reality is, you know, it's like anything else. Supply and demand will dictate the price of something and it will dictate the quality of it. So that puts people at this huge overdose risk when they're using substances that are not predictable, they're not standardized, and they were literally shifting from day to day. And we would put out an alert saying this substance is, is causing huge overdoses and the next day it would be a different color. And so it's really hard to stay on top of that. Um, so the prices have gone up, the quality has gone down, the availability has shifted, and that's a really, really hard place for a lot of people to be in while they're also experiencing isolation and lack of access to services and all the other things that, that have gone on during the pandemic. Go ahead, Grace. Yeah, I was just gonna um, add a little bit to that. Violet spoke about um, being able to um, properly know what's inside, what's in a drug, uh, what are the compounds within that drug um, that people are using, because really, I mean, folks don't really know uh, what they're using. Um, but the other, the flip side of that, that I, you know, I, I've heard about, and you know, we we talk we talk about with our healthcare partners is it also result, results in this uh, unexpected um, reaction for folks who are overdosing. So, you know, we hear from our shelter partners, for example, you know, um, the overdoses don't look the same anymore. It's, it's not a, a matter of um, someone getting, uh, getting um, naloxone and then just coming out of it. They look different now. And until we know why, what's in that drug, um, it's, it's really a guessing game. Every, as Violet said, you know, a drug can go through a community really quickly. So what, what, what someone might, what we might expect in terms of a reaction, um, what an overdose looks like 
on Tuesday may look different on Friday. And that's really, really hard for the people who are overdosing. And it's really, really hard for the people who are responding to that overdose. And uh, we've seen that in our community. We've, we've, we've held um, trauma-related uh, workshops for people who are working in shelters and are responding last year. And those are continuing because that trauma is very real. And, um, and uh, those re those re that response needs to happen uh, amongst people who aren't necessarily trained to respond to a medical emergency. And for context, I don't know how, um, how dialed in the, the audience is on opiates, um, but you know, probably most of the people watching this or have had an opiate in their life. Morphine is an opiate. Oxycontin, uh, T3s uh, contain opiates. Um, it, it's a great pain reliever, right? You get your wisdom teeth out, you get, uh, you get 10 little tablets to take home, you feel a lot better and uh, you, know, you finish your prescription and you carry on. Um, for us, we've carried morphine for years. We carry fentanyl as a drug to, to give for pain. Um, the big thing is the potency. Right, if we're if we're treating someone's pain, someone has a broken leg, we may give them ten milligrams of morphine in their IV, and uh, they'll be joking with us on the way to the hospital. Or we can give them one hundred micrograms of uh, of fentanyl to have the same effect. So um, far, far less, hundred times, a thousand times less potent, and that's pharmaceutical grade. The problem. Uh, and why we're seeing the overdoses um, and the, the, the difficulty with having, as Violet said, a, a, an unstable uh, market and not a great quality control is that uh, if you take a little too much heroin or a little too much uh, morphine, you're probably going to be okay. If you take a little too much fentanyl, you're into a potentially fatal overdose because it's so strong. Okay, <laughs> moving right along. Um, can we maybe touch on some of the, um, like we'll get, we'll get back to some of this stuff, but like what are some of the signs, like maybe some of us can look for, like Rob, Rob you said, we probably have all had opioids or we know someone or something like that. Like what are things that we might be able to look for in our community to see if maybe people need support? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's for Violet. I can tell you certainly the, the signs of, a, of an overdose, for sure. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll turn that over to, to Grace or, or Violet for, for really identifying um, people who are in need of some support. So I think it, again, comes down to we have this stereotype of what somebody who uses drugs looks like or how they act or or whatever that might be. So I think the first thing I would tell people is to really do some diving into what it really looks like. What does addiction look like? What does substance use look like across the board? Um, it's going to look different for, you know, a 17 year old living at home with her parents than it is for somebody who's staying in the shelter system, perhaps. Um, in general, it's really difficult to tell that somebody is using substances sometimes for a really long period of time, depending on what other services or supports or, you know, things they have going on in their life. It's, it's really easy for people to live a regular life while using substances until it stops being easy for them to do. And for every single person that I've met, there was a point where that happened. Um, keeping in mind, I work with people who have generally had long-term addictions. Um, so there isn't really a way to know that somebody's using drugs unless they're disclosing it to you, unless there's, you know, some very visible signs of active substance use. I think what I've realized over the years is that everybody has different coping skills. Everybody has different supports. And the best thing we can do for each other is to take care of each other, which sounds so cheesy as I say that. <laughs> as I say that. But that's what this boils down to. The majority, I mean, Grace touched on trauma, and I will echo that 100%. And if I had to attribute addiction to anything, I would just chant trauma, 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 trauma over and over again for the next hour. Um, and trauma is not always a terrible thing that happens to you. Sometimes it's something that should have happened but didn't. So it's the absence of supports. It's the absence of, 
you know, meaningful connections or contacts or, you know, resolutions to, to big things. Um, but as a community, we often don't take care of each other the way that we should. We don't encourage people to seek counseling after a traumatic experience. Um, that we have lengthy waiting lists for some of the trauma-informed services that are available in our community or people who don't have the funds to afford to seek counseling um, regularly and, and thoroughly. We need to destigmatize mental health <laughs> or mental illness, I guess, in this case. Um, we need to, you know, do a better job of creating environments where families get the support that they need, where kids who are experiencing trauma get the support that they need and their families as well. And so it's hard to look at our community and pick out one person and say this this is somebody who's going to need support because some people are strangely resilient in the face of absolutely devastating things and other people it seems to be the very smallest of events or a non-event even that sort of nudges them towards towards substance use and then into addiction so i think you know if there's somebody in your life who is going through something something big or something small the best thing we can do is just be there to offer, to listen, to be supportive. And then if they're looking for additional services to really dig into that whenever possible, to find somebody who can support them beyond what might be appropriate for us as individuals. Um, if someone is experiencing addiction, if they're experiencing substance use already, then the conversation has to shift to how do we keep you alive? which sounds so dramatic when I say that, but that's what we're looking at right now. People who are experimenting with some of the drugs that are out there in the hopes of finding relief from, you know, whatever's going on, sometimes talking isn't enough. Um, and so, you know, they're moving on to, to other methods it's like substance use. And then it really is a life or death conversation, not a judgmental one, not a we need to, you know, I don't know, kidnap you and send you off to treatment kind of conversation, but a practical hands-on in this very moment, how do I keep you alive and breathing? How do I make sure you see tomorrow and, and where do we go from here? And that's a really big topic that I'll just leave at, at that, I think, and let maybe Grace or, or Rob say more. So I'll, I'll just build on that. I did see a question in the chat about harm reduction and uh, what is kind of the end goal of harm reduction. And um, Violet, you kind of opened the door to that conversation. So I thought it might be a good time to kind of pick up on, on, on that question and, and maybe attempt to, uh, to provide a little bit of information. Um, we, we had this question a lot as we were going through the, 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 the consultations for the Consumption Treatment Services site. Harm reduction as a concept, I think, can be a really difficult thing for somebody to wrap their minds around um, because, you know, at the surface and what Viola talked about is it's about keeping people safer and healthier and alive. Um, What's interesting, I think, about uh, harm reduction, especially in the CTS, CTS context, and certainly in the harm reduction clinics that, um, that we have in public health, is that harm reduction for a lot of people, a lot of the clients that we see who may not have any other services or access any other services, they may not have any other supports that they can count on and go to, um, that it really just becomes a doorway into having a relationship that's different than any other relationships or lack thereof that they have in their lives. And so they may be coming in the door for some, you know, sterile drug use equipment and some naloxone, um, but it's an opportunity to sit down and be seen and be heard and to be asked about how their day is going and what other services might they need. And I know that we sit, we see those folks at the harm reduction clinics all the time. And uh, I know that Violet and her staff at the CTS, um, that those, those interactions are even more compounded in that regard and that they create a safe and positive environment for people to um, feel like they're a person and be seen as a person and that just leads to good things so it can lead to to far more far more conversations about health down the road yeah and when you when you think of again uh, we all uh, probably have or had that that stereotypical opioid user in in mind so if you take that that segment of the the people who use drugs people who use opioids population think of how they are treated almost every minute of every day um, judgment constant judgment uh, nobody wants to be anywhere near them 
just treated terribly. And one of the strengths of, um, I've always said since I've, I've, I've come into to meeting this harm reduction group, um, my group of heroes is the sanguine folks, and Violet hates it when I say that, but there's no judgment. They, they are the most giving people. They, they want to help. They want to provide whatever um, people need, and that's the only place that that, that segment of, of the population is going to find that, and they know they're going to find that every time they, that, that, that van pulls in or every time that they go to, to that uh, CTS. So um, I think that's, that's a, big, a big part of it there is, is just that non-judgmental um, presence that Sanguine uh, gives in, in, when it comes to harm reduction. It's not just clean needles and, and a place to use drugs. It's, it's the ability to open up and, and what more do you need and how can we start to get you on the road to recovery. I'm laughing a little bit, Rob, because earlier the question about how has the pandemic changed this, um, my first instinctual answer was we don't get to hug people anymore. And that is a huge part of, I mean, that sounds ridiculous in the grand scheme of things, but I didn't realize how many people I hug on a daily basis until I couldn't do it anymore. And people walk in with their arms outstretched and we're going, oh, can't, but soon, hopefully soon. <laughs> but yeah, that, um, you know, our goal is always to create that relationship. Harm reduction is about relationships. It's about, you know, understanding what people want, what they need, and then we're gonna find a way to make that happen because when people are connected and they feel loved and cared for and understood on any level, it's so much easier to make a change than when you feel shamed and judged and, you know, that you don't have any worth in some cases. I mean, that's an awful place for people to sit. And honestly, most of the people that I've met through the work that I do, are among my favorite people in the entire world. They are phenomenal human beings who have been through an incredible, I mean, their stories are incredible and they possess more strength and, you know, more character than I could ever hope to have. And, you know, I feel really privileged to, to do this work and get to meet people that others might not ever have that chance if, if they're not willing to, you know, step back a little bit and recognize the stereotypes and things. So yeah, relationships. And that relationship stuff is really the basis of the CTS, right? It's, I remember when, again, during the consultation sessions and really trying to push to get one of these opened was maybe someone, uh, a person who uses drugs comes in there 10 times and turns right and goes down to the, to the consumption room and, and uses that drug of choice, fentanyl or heroin or methamphetamine, whatever it is, and they come out, but maybe the 11th time they come in, they turn left and they talk to a counselor or they talk to a physician or something and maybe, you know, and maybe the next time they come in, they go back to that consumption room. But, but one of these times they're going to start some treatment and maybe it's going to, it's going to stick because it's a tough road, right? Drug, drug and alcohol uh, treatment is a tough road. I always say that, you know, one of the core parts of harm reduction is any positive change. And so when people come in and we immediately talk about treatment, people are like, that is a huge undertaking. Like, that is not something I can just do this afternoon. I can't, I can't do that. So we start with things like, you know, have you eaten today? That's self-care. That's a little piece of getting a little bit healthier in a lifestyle that doesn't always accommodate having a snack or stopping to drink some water. Or, you know, have you rested at all today? Have you sat for 20 minutes even to just think and breathe and be part of a conversation that isn't, you know, stressful. And all of those little things, like you said, start to build. And, and once you're sort of in the practice of taking care of yourself, just little tiny smidges at a time, that gets a little more each time, a little more each time. And we start to see some incredible changes coming from that. But even when we don't see change, we know it's happening. And it's, it's just slower. It's just a different method that somebody's going a different route that they're going. And there's always that hope that someone will make some huge dramatic change. But if we can keep them alive, if we can keep them, you know, somebody's family member or loved one alive, we'll settle for that. I mean, I'll take that as a, as a suitable goal. <laughs> Okay, this is a really great conversation. Um, but I'm gonna switch over just to answer a few of the questions that have come in. 
Um, and then we can get through those and then maybe either more questions, if people have questions, um, can come in or we can talk a little bit more um, with this obviously great conversation and see where it goes. Um, there kind of early on we were talking about how it can, you know, people might get prescribed from like a doctor's office. Um, is there generally a place where we are seeing it starts? Like, is it on the streets? Is it in the doctor's office? It totally, yeah, okay. <laughs> there was a lot of media discussion um, about overprescribing by physicians, um, both in the US and in Canada and probably, you know, worldwide. I think that's a discussion. And I work for a physician who, so I like to grill him on these topics and ask him, and I'm not going to speak on his behalf because somewhere he'd be cringing right now. Um, but, you know, the reality is people are not good with dealing with pain. And physical pain for some people is a lifelong thing. And we, you know, for some of us, I'll speak for myself, I have chronic shoulder issues. And I'm privileged enough to have access to physio, to massage. I have great benefits. Um, I have a physician who, you know, tells me don't lift heavy things. And then when I do lift heavy things, yells at me for it later. Um, and that's a huge privilege. For a lot of my clients, when they go and they're in pain, whatever that physical pain may be, there's none of that. There's no massage, there's no physio, there's no take time off from your job that's physical labor. There's, you know, there's nothing other than those pills. And the tolerance to opioids builds fairly rapidly. So, you know, initially you need a smaller amount and as time goes by, you absolutely need to increase that dose. And for, a, I mean, this is a really big topic, but for a while, you know, physicians were able to prescribe fairly large quantities of, of opioids in order to, to, you know, work with people's pain. Once it was really um, noticeable that it was addictive and that people were becoming addicted to these opioids, a lot of physicians became afraid. They didn't want to lose their license. They didn't want to over-prescribe. They didn't want to harm their patients, whatever their motivation was to make some changes in that. And so we saw people getting cut off of their prescribed medications. Um, and that leads to people seeking other other avenues. So that's that leads people to the illicit substances that are available, you know, out in the community. So certainly, you know, there are there are a number of people who have become you know, dependent on opioids as a result of things like that. But I don't think there's really an overprescribing issue at this point. I think, you know, as we've kind of addressed, it, opioids work so well on emotional pain as well as physical pain. And for some people, that's the relief that they are looking for. And, you know, it's, it's not something that is really preventable in that sense. Once it's started, it's started, whether it's through a physician or otherwise. I found it interesting. I don't blame doctors. That's what I'm saying. No, <clears throat> I found it interesting that um, I think it was late '90s, early 2000s, when the opioid crisis, well before it was uh, in Canada, maybe it was on the on the west coast of of Canada, but really uh, Virginia, West Virginia, primarily, really, really struggled with it. And and people, you know, why why there? Well. A lot of coal mines, a lot of really, really physical work, no sick time. You, if you want to put food on your table, you have to get up and you have to go to work. So when you have those shoulder problems that I have from Lift and Stretchers and Violet has, and we have great benefits, and like you said, we can do the physio, there's none of that. There's no calling in sick because your back is sore. You better get in that coal mine or you're not having food on the table. And really, so, you know, it's to manage the pain initially, but then um, then that dependency develops and without the proper supports, it's really, really hard to, to get off that. Okay, um, we'll, we'll go to the next question. Um, can you let us know, um, I'm not sure who would be best for this question, but like what kind of pricing are we looking at and what are some of the common names that of these opioids or like street drugs that we'll see? I can speak to pricing. Um, right now it is all over the map. <laughs> so again with that supply and demand, um, you know, which dealer is advertising, for lack of a better word, advertising their product as better. Um, it, you know, it's re people will often say, well how much does it cost to be addicted to opioids? And the answer is pretty much everything you've got when you get to it, um, 
if you're just starting out and your tolerance is low, $25 a day, you know, that's, that's about where you're looking or even less. As time goes by, that number just goes up and up and up. And right now with that unpredictable supply, that price could be, you know, 50 times higher depending, or could be, you know, still that same level because people are aware that what they have doesn't have great quality. So it's really, really hard to talk about pricing when it comes to illicit substances um, because it is very much supply, supply and demand and very much depends on your tolerance. In terms of the drugs that are out there, um, I mean, Rob had mentioned sort of the prescribed things that are out there. So we do see people who are using, you know, prescriptions or who are diverting their prescriptions, so selling them out in the community. Um, you know, heroin is not something we see much of locally because the purity is just not there and it's hard to import into Canada um, at this point in time, at least, and has been, we haven't seen a lot of heroin over the past, I'm going to say five years even. It's, it's sort of a niche thing at this point. Um, but things like Dilaudid, Oxycontin, Oxy, the old Oxys are gone. Um, you know, morphine we still see out there. Fentanyl right now is the biggest one um, in terms of the opioids that are available in our community. Fentanyl is at the top of that list and it's the one that we see most often in, in the CTS that people are bringing in to use. Um, people are, you know, they have access sometimes to hydromorph, um, dilaudid, things like that. So a mix of the prescribed and the illicit. Right, and and the the one thing about fentanyl to remember is um, you touched on it's it's hard to, it's hard to bring heroin in, because heroin is made in in the opium producing countries Afghanistan Pakistan places like that. Um, fentanyl is is synthetic, so it is made in a lab somewhere, maybe in Canada, maybe in Mexico, maybe in China, maybe somewhere in the U.S. But um, and that's why. Uh, one, it's, it's easier to import. It takes a small amount to be cut into a very large amount. Um, but also, um, it's much easier to, to hide and to bring into the, into the country because it's just a powder and it's synthetic. So it can be made not anywhere. It's not like Breaking Bad where you're in, a, in an RV. I think it takes a little more than that. But, um, um, you know, it's not, it's not harvesting poppies and making, making heroin. Uh, that's why, that's why you, you just don't see the heroin anymore. Um, would you guys suggest that everyone carries naloxone? Yes, please. <laughs> so, Rob, you, that's an easy question, I guess, but, um, Rob, you said earlier that you can give us the, you know, if, what, what does someone look like when they're overdosing? Like, so how would, if I'm carrying naloxone, how do I know when to use it? Well, there's a great thing about naloxone, um, and that it's really, uh, as benign a, a, a medication as you can give somebody. Um, you know, a typical uh, opioid overdose is somebody that is um, really having nods or is unconscious, um, breathing very shallow, pinpoint pupils. Uh, but, you know, what if, what if that person's just sleeping and you go and give them this naloxone um, and they haven't taken an opioid, they're just <laughs> trying to sleep? Well, it doesn't do anything. So um, it's as close to the perfect antidote as you can find because um, I don't, Violet, you, you do, you train people when, when you're giving that out. How long is the training on how to use naloxone? I can, I mean, we all know I can talk for hours on end. So if you give me two <laughs> hours to train something, I'll take it. Um, but I could train someone in under five minutes. And that's not because yeah. I'm particularly skilled at it, but it's, it's just that straightforward. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, uh, you know, recognizing the symptoms, um, uh, recognizing what you're going to see in an overdose, but you don't have to be a hundred percent sure, right? If I, if I'm giving somebody a cardiac medication, I, I better know for sure what I'm seeing on that monitor and that I need to treat it with that medication. Cause if it's not, then, um, I may end up doing some harm. That's the great thing about uh, everybody should carry it. And if you give it to the wrong person, you're like, oh, hey, sorry. Uh, didn't mean to shoot that up your nose. Have a good day. And no bad, no bad things are going to happen to that person. So um, that's why, you know, you can save a life, but you're not going to harm somebody by giving it to someone who didn't need it. 
I mean, so, my kids have carried naloxone since they were in grade eight. Um, because my kids apparently are supposed to leave my, my site sometimes. So they go to parties, they <laughs> you know, hang out with their friends against, against my better judgment and protective nature. Um, you know, and with some of the substances that are out there not being predictable, we know people experiment. We know kids, teenagers are experimenting with things. That's just, that's reality. And so the harm reduction part of that is, you know, talking about drugs at home, talking about substances and talking about what an overdose looks like. And I've always told my kids when in doubt, like Rob said, just spray that up their nose. And they may be, you know, if they have a wet nostril and they're cranky about it, cool. Um, but if you keep somebody alive, if you save them from dying, that's even cooler. Um, and there's no harm in using it in adults, in youth, you know, anybody can have a naloxone administered to them without any concern. So it's really a good, a good medication to have. And it's such a small amount of space that's taken up in your purse or your backpack or, you know, whatever it is that you carry around with you that it's not a big deal to carry with you. And, and the great news is, is that it's really available you know, in many places throughout the community. There are many harm reduction partners that you can find on the Region of Waterloo website uh, who are naloxone distribution partners, um, but you can also pick it up at a Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, it does not require a health card. Uh, they will give training right then and there and you can leave it a kit. Um, so, and there's, there's two forms. There's the nasal, which, the nasal form, which is probably the easiest to use. Um, that's the one that gives you the wet nostril. <laughs> and, um, and then there's, there's injectable. And um, I believe the pharmacies carry the nasal. And, um, you know, really, I would echo what uh, Rob and Violet said. Everyone, if they, if they are able to get a, a kit and get trained, there's no harm in having it around. And we always, you know, when, we're, when we talk about naloxone and public naloxone, um, we always ask that people call us first, if they can, before they give it, or shortly after they gave it. We are, um, there's a significant percentage of the overdose calls that we go to where the patient is awake and talking and fine when we get there. That's fantastic. We still want you to come to the hospital with us because, you know, again, maybe we can have you turn left when we get to the hospital and maybe you start some treatment. But often they refuse to, to come. They say they're fine. Great, no problem. We we have no issue with with going to where the where the incident happened and somebody wakes up and they don't need us anymore. Used to be one of my favorite calls. So that's great. And yeah, Grace, you answered my next question, was which was where we can get it. So that's that's great because I think you've sold us all on on getting it if we don't already have it, right? Um, our next question that came in, um, and I think Violet, you kind of touched on this. Um, what is the end result of harm reduction te techniques? Are we trying to get into someone into treatment and recovery, um, using safely for the rest of their life? Like, and how long do your client, like your relationships with the client tend to last? So maybe you can start with that one. So in terms of, are we trying to get people into recovery? Or are we, you know, keeping people alive and safely so they can continue using the answer to both of those is yes um, because it comes down to what that person wants and you know I I will be honest harm reduction like the work that I do right now is not something I ever envisioned myself doing um, I don't have a history of substance use I don't have it in my family this is not something that was near and dear to my heart when I started in school <laughs> and what really hit home for me is thinking about all the things in life that I have done or the, the ways that I've been lucky or the things that have gone well for me that might not have otherwise just by luck. And over the years, looking at how I got from point A to point B in my life came down to, you know, the right conversation at the right time with the right person. And that's what we try to do when we're working with clients. So I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to treat you with respect. I'm going to love the heck out of you. And then I'm going to listen and I'm going to do my best to help you do whatever it is. For some people, like, you know, it's a really quick turnaround. If they're like, you know what? I just want to go to treatment. I want to, I want to start something and okay, let's make that happen. For other people, it's a, it's a longer process. Um, I work with people now that I've known since I started my job in 2011 and are they still using drugs? Yes. Um, do they still have addictions? Yes. Does that mean I'm not doing a great job? No, <laughs> at least I don't think so. You know, they're alive. 
So that's phenomenal. In some cases, they've reconnected with their family. In some cases, they have meaningful employment at the CTS now because we do employ people who use drugs um, as peer workers specifically, so they can talk about their lived experiences and what it's like and show that face that, you know, I also use drugs and here I am and, you know, you can trust this space. Um, in other cases, you know, people come and go from my world. So I see them for six months and then they go off to treatment and I never see them again. Um, a vast number of people have died over the last nine years, 10 years, more than I could even conceive of when I started doing this work. And my hope is that we're done with that soon, that, you know, people will stay alive a lot longer. But you know, it's really, it's like any other change that any of us want to make in our lives. For some of us, it's going to be really easy to make that change. We just need the right nudge and suddenly we're on that path and life is great and we're doing all the right things. Um, for most people, that's not how life works. And so the goal with harm reduction is to build that relationship and then be there as long as we're needed and to make sure that we're adding in additional supports wherever we can and take people on whatever journey it is that they want to be, they want to be going on. Um, if people are going to use drugs for the rest of their lives, which some people absolutely will, um, my thought on that is I want that life to be as long as possible. I want it to be as healthy as possible. I want their substance use to impact on them, their family, their friends, their community as little as possible and just keep people alive and, you know, working towards their goals. Because for some of us, change is not an easy an easy path or even possible in some levels. But again, that any positive change, no matter how tiny it is, has a huge impact on people. And I think that's what we focus on most. And those big wins, you know, we're happy when they happen, but we don't expect them to happen either. People just have to do what they need to do and we need to keep them alive. Does anyone else want to add on to that one or, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, Grace, I'm wondering if you can comment on some of the things that are happening in the community um, to support these people and, you know, ways that, um, you know, all these maybe behind the scenes things that are happening. Sure. I'll talk a little bit about um, the work of the Waterloo Region Integrated Drug Strategy. And I'll just preface it by saying um, a lot of the work that we were doing pre-COVID has shifted um, and it had to shift in, in the last six months. So the Rotary Region Integrated Drug Strategy, it's been around for quite a while. Um, it's it's a, a number of uh, different folks and different agencies who have um, some connection to the world of substance use, whether that be through prevention, so working with youth, creating meaningful opportunities so that um, the temptation to use substances early um, is reduced um, or perhaps even eliminated uh, for some. Um, there are, there is the harm reduction, which we've spoken about at length. Um, there's the recovery and rehabilitation piece that is about uh, treatment and making sure that different types of treatment options are available for people depending on what they need. And then there's the justice and enforcement piece, which is related to uh, often policing and the justice system around how we, how we deal with, with um, drug related offenses. So uh, all of that work um, comes together at the Water Region Integrated Drug Strategy. And over the last, uh, gosh, like 15 years, I would say, um, we have been working on strategies that together um, make an impact on problematic substance use in our community. Um, about two years ago, uh, we, we, we've, we kind of focused that work even more on the opioid crisis and developed uh, the Special Committee in Opioid Response, where folks involved across all of those four pillars get together and talk specifically about what we need in our community to address opioid use for the long term. Um, so some of that uh, pertains to the consumption treatment services site that we talked about. Um, that's one piece of the harm reduction pillar. Um, it's certainly not all. But the other pieces relate to creating more um, prevention strategies. So really focusing on some upstream interventions that provide engagement for, for uh, youth who may be more susceptible or more vulnerable to, to um, starting drugs early, as I mentioned. And so, you know, that was one of the key pieces that our community had identified as being needed. Um, you know, we often talk about uh, sports as being helpful, arts, um, you know, opportunities being helpful. Uh, and, and I think, you know, often those are available for folks who have money and not necessarily um, always for those who don't. Um, and so it's, it's really making sure that we're leveling the, leveling the playing field 
for, for many of our youth. Um, the other side of it is um, what we talk about, um, supportive housing. So folks who may be underhoused have precarious housing, ensuring that they have housing that have additional supports that allow them to keep that housing long term. Um, and that housing becomes a foundation of a stable life uh, and a point from which they can have an address, they can potentially you know, look for employment um, and, and stabilize in other areas and, and, and ultimately gain health. And so those, you know, when we talk about opioid responses and, and what we do to, to address an opioid crisis, those, those, those services, those programs may not come to mind, but they're the types of things that we need in our community long term that lead ultimately to um, a healthier uh, a healthy community overall and a reduction in problematic substance use. Um, we did talk about the harm reduction piece and then we talk about the CTS. Um, it's certainly not the only intervention. Um, it's a really, really important one and it's something that our community needed. Um, but there are, you know, there's a comprehensive health harm reduction strategy uh, that goes along with that that ranges from um, having sterile drug use equipment available, all the way to, um, to CTS and, and beyond. And so um, those are the types of things that were happening pre-COVID. Um, they, they are continuing to happen. They're just looking a little bit different now that we're in COVID uh, situation. And in some cases, the urgency has increased. And so uh, that's kind of some of the exciting things that are happening in our community right now. And uh, you know, I said at the beginning, and I'll say it again, it's not, um, it's not the type of thing that one agency can do alone. It requires a whole community effort um, across the spectrum of uh, services, across the spectrum of sectors, um, and, uh, and you know, it, it has to be a community strategy. So I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if Rob or Violet, do you have anything to add around that? Some things that, um, you know, the CTS uh, contentious issue shouldn't have been it was um, fantastic that it, that it finally came in but outside of those contentious you know we have the rapid access um, mm -hmm. addiction clinics that uh, that opened a couple years ago now um, there's been so many changes the peer support um, better access to mental health the eye-opener for me was you know I always equated a serious substance use um, with you know, uh, there's a there's an overlap there with mental health um, issues. That's that's undeniable. Um, but housing, and and every time um, you speak to somebody, really that has uh, lived experience um, as a, a someone who used drugs, it's like it is impossible to focus on your recovery, to focus on on kicking that addiction if you don't even if you can't even have a place to to lay your head, a place that you know when you leave and you lock and all your stuff is going to be there when you come back. If you don't have that, how do you focus on, on trying to, to move forward and take those baby steps that, that, that are involved in finally overcoming an addiction? It's not possible. I just like to echo Grace um, just around the community partners and the partnerships that we have. Um, harm reduction doesn't exist in a vacuum. And that housing piece is huge. Um, you know, having police involved with the harm reduction is huge. Having agencies that on the surface don't appear to have anything to do with substance use at all be educated about harm reduction and about substance use is another huge part in that. And I think, you know, we've been, we've had the interim CTS open now for almost a year. We're coming up on our one year anniversary, which is just fantastic. But we're also getting ready to open up the full site. And one of the great things and the things that I'm looking forward to the most are those community partners and having them, you know, on site and available to provide those supports and services that people have requested. And to really, again, emphasize that this is a community response. It's, it's not just one agency. It's not just Sanguine. It's not just public health, you know, providing harm reduction. It's everybody. In, in our day to day, even just, you know, people listening tonight who go and get an naloxone kit or mention to their friend or their family, hey, I heard I should get a naloxone kit and so should you. Or did you know what's happening out in the community? That's part of harm reduction. That's part of making our community safer and better for everybody that's involved. And the partnerships, you know, they don't have to be huge formal partnerships. The number of people who dropped off, you know, handmade face masks for us to give out in the community, things like that, it's harm reduction 
on a level that just, you know, makes our community better. And it's, it's really, really important that everybody kind of work together on it so we can do it strongly and, you know, the best way we possibly can. Awesome. Um, I think if anyone has any final questions, um, I still have one or two here, but if anyone does um, want to put them in the chat, then they can, they can do that if we want to squeeze something else in. Um, you've all given us obviously a lot of info and I think we have a couple of takeaways um, that we could, you know, the, the naloxone kits, just really supporting each other um, and all these things. But I, I would, was wondering if you guys could each comment on some pain points that we have right now um, or any actions that like people could take, whether it's, you know, SVP members or other individuals, you said even just talking with, uh, you know, a friend about getting a kit, um, but ways that your maybe communities or your organizations could use help. Um, but I let you look really eager to answer this question. <laughs> I wasn't specifically. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think for me, you know, the way, the way to really help is that education piece. Um, question what you're reading, question what you're seeing, and question what you're hearing. Um, you know, sometimes I see things in the media, for example, globally, like no, I don't specifically mean locally, and I know we need to dig deeper. I know we need to think more about some of the topics. Drugs are scary for a lot of people. Just, you know, as a blanket statement, we were all told that drugs are bad. So people who use drugs are bad. And so we should be afraid of them. Um, and like I said, most of the clients that I work with are among my favorite people in the world. They're phenomenal humans. I always tell people, you know, people will say, is your job scary? Is it dangerous? Is it whatever? And that I think speaks to the stereotypes around substance use as well. You know, this idea that drug users are out to harm you and they're not. Generally, that's, that's just not a thing. Um, so really questioning what you've been told about people in our community, questioning, you know, when you see somebody and your first thought is, I want to, I want to go the other way, or I want to walk the other way. I don't want to make eye contact. Um, you know, thinking about things like when someone asks you for money, you know, you're walking down the street and they're asking if you have spare change, thinking about what your reaction to that looks like, you know, really just questioning why we feel the way we do about certain members of our community and how do we change that? How do we shift it so people feel like they're part of our community, so people are acknowledged, you know, they're, they're part of our world and we're part of their world because it's, the it's the same world, it's the same community and everybody deserves to belong and to be healthy and to be as happy as they possibly can, which requires that connectedness again. It's really hard for me to say, you know, how an individual can help because I think that's the base that we need to keep working on most of us is just really questioning our own biases and questioning you know the things that we were told maybe when we were growing up or even the things that you know we talk about with our friends now um you know i think the agencies that are working in the community and some of the community groups who are out there you know they're not specifically agencies are doing a great job of trying to deal with some really big things and make the world a better place which again sounds just a little bit cheesy, but it's, it's true. <laughs> you know, we're all just trying to make things better for, you know, the people that we care about, but also for our own kids, for our own families, you know, for our neighbors, for all of us. And I think it's possible, which maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe a little lofty dreaming on that one. But, you know, I think if we are all working together and can just take a deep breath and question all the things, we can make some really great progress. And I, uh I'll, I'll put in that along with questioning what you hear um, and and what you read, and that is absolutely not a shot at our media. I find I think the the media here in Waterloo Region have done a great job in 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 um, accurately portraying the issue and those that it affects. Um, talk to your politicians uh, without uh, some some. Uh, I'll say brave politicians in Kitchener and Waterloo Region, we wouldn't have one CTS site. Um, there should be more, um, but there's a, there's a vocal minority um, out there. And um, I think the, the majority of people who can look at a, at a, at a subject and, uh, and decide for themselves what's best, often just sit back. I'm, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. Uh, um, but talk to your politicians. Uh, 
advocate for more funding for your paramedic service. Now that's, that has nothing to do with the opioid. I just thought I'd throw that in there if you're talking to your politicians, but advocate for, for those supports and, and um, why aren't we supporting people who use drugs and why aren't we um, trying to minimize the harm that comes from that? Harm reduction is seat belts and bike helmets and clean needles and consumption and treatment sites. There's no difference between, between a law that requires you to wear a bike helmet and being able to get a clean needle to, um, for, your, for people who use drugs. So, um, you know, just by being in this, in this group, you're, you're showing an interest. You know, just take that interest and, and next election say, hey, where do you stand on this uh, consumption and treatment site? Um, I think it's good. I think that there hasn't been a rise in crime. You know, what do you think about that? And, um, you know, stand up. Yeah, I think um, those are, you stole my, my thoughts, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have others. <laughs> um, you know, I, I go back to the fact that overdose really doesn't discriminate. It, it affects everybody, every gender, every age, every income level. And I think as a community, we need to, there, there, you know, I talked about no one agency can can really be make the difference um, for everybody, uh, but there's really no one solution that's going to make the difference for everybody. We are diverse as a community. People who use substances are diverse, and we need to continue to be just be creative and brave and compassionate um, in order to prevent overdose fatalities from from continuing to happen in our community. Um, we we the CTS serves. Um, you know, does such a wonderful job at meeting people where they're at and, and uh, re, you know, working to provide overdose prevention services. Um, we need more, we need different um, approaches and we need to, uh, to bravely move towards that. My, you know, when I think about, you know, what I've learned over the last number of years and, and Violet, you spoke of this beautifully, is, is, what, is what is below um, our fear? What is it? And it's, it's and what's driving uh, hesitancy to to um, talk about harm reduction and, and talk about drug use in the way that we are now able to talk about things like mental health we had the bell let's talk campaign a couple of years a number of years ago um, that I think has done wonders for for mental health and and bringing that out into the open and I, I think you know we need to shed the stigma around um, substance use as being a personal weakness um, I think we need to talk about drug use and drug addiction as being a health issue um, we need to put to bed the shame that parents, families, and the people who are using substances feel day to day, um, or else we're really not going to have a world where we can, where we have people who are looking for help and are looking for avenues um, to slowly get out of that, that cycle of addiction. Um, and I think it's, you know, we need to talk about that. We need to make it okay for people to talk about addiction in their families. We need to talk about, you know, make it okay for people to talk about addiction in their own lives and um, in the way that we talk about any other health issue. Do you have one other thing to say? Um, if it's not already really, really readily apparent, we love talking about what we do when it comes to harm reduction. And so if you have questions about why things happen or why any harm reduction agency does the work that they do, chances are really good they'd like to talk about it talk about it for hours and hours and hours. So don't invite us to dinner parties. It's the worst idea you could possibly have, um, unless it's gonna be a really long dinner party. Um, but the reality is, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to know where to get answers to things that are happening in our community. And one of the best things you can do is if you, if you know somebody working in harm reduction or you know how to get in touch with Rob, you know, give us a call and we will happily answer whatever that question may be with all the expertise that we bring with us or know somebody who can provide that expertise and give those answers to you um, rather than, you know, just wondering. Because again, that communication piece, that talking about what we're doing is really, really important as a community, I think. And early on in the uh, opioid crisis, uh, Violet and Grace and myself and some others, um, we would go to talk to any group that invited us to go and talk to them. We were insufferable. Uh, getting getting that message out there. So um, yeah, you know, we're we're uh, we'll still do that. We're we're still uh, passionate about um, about letting people know what the problem is, but also that it's not a problem without a solution.
it's it's not an easy solution, but there is some solutions out there. Awesome, and we just have a couple of minutes left. If anyone has any final comments, this has been a really, really great discussion. Just jump in. Everyone's happy. Taryn, do you have anything to add or Rose? I would invite you to a dinner party, all of you, anytime. Thank you so much for spending your Thursday night with us. Uh, I feel like I've definitely come away having learned a little bit more um, about some of the challenges, but also about some of the triumphs that our community has had. So congratulations on the one year anniversary of the temporary site, and it will be fantastic to see how that grows. Um, and yes. Thank you all so much. Um, attendees, thank you very much as well. Uh, this session has been recorded, so we will be posting it up and sharing some resources shortly after the webinar uh, that have been shared by the wonderful folks from Waterloo Region Integrated Drug Strategy. Uh, links to their sites as well as some links to some language around being inclusive. That was a learning journey for me, was learning, let's change the title of the session because it's not quite right, because it's stigmatizing. And it's little things like that, like learning to, you know, take a couple of letters out of a word, but it can make a huge difference. So thank you for being here for me as well. Um, last thing to share is thank you to the audience. Uh, we will be donating just over $500 to Sanguine um, as proceeds from this webinar. So thank you for being here tonight and take care everyone. <laughs>